Uh, hello guys. Yeah, this is Dr. Joseph Kimani. Today we are going to revise biology. It's a KCSC paper prediction. So if you are in high school, between form one, form two, form three, form four, it's a paper and so it cuts all across. Yeah, so we won't cover the entire paper, but uh, we'll cover the better part of it. Uh, yeah, let's get started. Huh? So the first question is, uh, the scientific name for French bean is uh, Facilus vagaris. So Pate asked, what taxon does the term Facilus represent? So uh, in naming of scientific naming of organisms, the organism in, uh, is given two names. The first name is usually the generic name, and the second one is usually the species name. So from the first question, we can term that uh, Faciolas uh, represent the generic name, whereas Vulgaris represent the species name. Uh, for the part B question, it is says uh, state two rules that are followed when giving a scientific name to an organism. So you can see one of the rules is that uh, uh, the organism is given two names, one a species name, okay, one a generic name, and the other one a species name. And the two names are, are written separately. Written and uh, when they're written, they're aligned separately, but when they are typed, uh, they are, they'll be written in italics. And the other part is that uh, the generic name the first name, the first letter of the generic name starts with a capital letter, whereas all the other letters are written in small letters, which means that uh, in the species name, all of it is written in a, uh, in a small letters. Uh, for the question part two, we are asked that uh, what is the function of the mirror in the microscope? Remember, the microscope is a device, uh, which may be electronic, uh, that is used uh, to you know, to make objects that appear to be small to appear somehow larger so that you can appreciate with the eyes. Eh? So when you ask what is the function of the mirror in the microscope, so the mirror is the, its main function generally, you can say that it reflects lights onto the stage through the condenser. So the, especially for the light microscope, which has the mirror, uh, the light from the environment eh, will be reflected through the condenser onto the stage eh, for elimination of the specimen. And then part B, which organella would be abundant in skeletal muscle cell and the palisade cell? For the skeletal muscle cell, remember, this is an organelle that requires energy, a muscle cell for movement, energy is required. And as you studied in the topic of the cell, you can recall that uh, the organelle responsible for production of energy is the mitochondria. So basically what you expect to find in abundance in a skeletal muscle cell will be the mitochondria. For the palisade cell now, it's found in plants. Uh, and now the palisade cell now, if uh, you find it in plants, basically plants are green. So what do you expect mostly? That we'll have a lot of chloroplast. You know, chloroplasts are the ones that contains chlorophyll, the green coloring matter in plants. So a palisade cell will have a chloroplast in abundance. And now for number three, uh, a single in shoot was exposed to unidirectional light as shown below. And then the setup was left in the dark room for three days. Sir. So uh, to, to make a drawing of the expected results at the end of the experiment. So if you are to make a drawing, uh, this is the plant light. Yeah, so uh, remember if light is coming from this way, coming from this way, the plant will tend, or the shoot will tend to bend towards the light. Why? It's because uh, the plant contains some organism, okay, not organism, but hormone called auxin. So auxin is, uh, how do we say it? Uh, it's negatively phototropic, such that uh, when it is directed towards a unidirectional source of light, the auxins will tend to migrate to this other side here. So from this side to this other side, that's where the auxin will migrate to. Meaning that if they migrate to this other side here, it will cause elongation of cells on this side of the plant. That's to the mm -hmm. say to the to the left side. It will cause elongation of cells on the left side of the plant more than on the right side. When they elongate more on the left side than the right side, the plant will bend to the right towards the source of light. 
and now explain the expected results at the end of the experiment which we just said because uh, so the answer for part eight you make a drone it will be like this uh, bending towards this uh, source of light but uh, for the explaining is how the auxin migrates makes elongation of the cells the, then the plant will bend towards the source of light uh, and then stage two advantages of breathing through the nose than through the mouth. Now, the nose is better suited for breathing for some basic new reasons, several reasons. But uh, if you want to know the advantages of breathing through the nose or the, the mouth, then you have to check the adaptations of the nose. First of all, in the nost nostrils, we have some hairs. Huh? So these hairs are meant to trap dust. So meaning that the air that will enter that through the nose huh? to the trachea and all that will be dust free dust particle free. But now through the mouth, they don't have those cells huh, to trap the dust particles. So that's one advantage of the nose bigger than the mother. Then talking about uh, the nose also is adapted uh, to moistening. Huh? It moistens the air. So the air that will enter through the nose will burst of all, be dust free, and it will also be moistened. So cleaned, moistened, and dust free. Uh, so those are the basically two advantages of breathing through the nose. And now for part five, give two mineral elements that are required in the synthesis of chlorophyll. So chlorophyll uh, is the green color in matter in plants. So the mineral elements required in synthesis of chlorophyll, first of all, you have the magnesium, that's one of them, and the other one is iron. So those two, those two, yeah, those two, those two elements are, are required. Uh, that's magnesium and iron for the production or synthesis of chlorophyll. And now uh, the environmental conditions that can cause seedlings. That's number six. So first of all is temperature. When you talk about temperature, excessive high temperatures can cause seedlings. Same to excessively low temperatures, like you say negative, that will cause seedlings. So those are that was one of the environmental conditions. And then uh, another environmental condition that can cause sediments is uh, lack of water. You know, water. Water is necessary for germination. So if you don't have water, then what do you expect? There will be no germination. Now, let's see about the next part, part B. In part, the part of the leaf that elongates during a pigeon germination. A pigeon germination. So pigeon germination, remember, is the one for, for example, the an example of uh, a seed that I got uh, pigeon germination is that one for the bees. So now uh, you can take this factor that if you see AP, then the answer will be hypo. What do I mean? If it's about a pigeon germination, then uh, the part of the leaf that you elongate, uh, it will be the hypocotyl pushing the seed out of the ground. But when you see hypogeal germination, it will be the epicotyl. So they are vice versa, opposite of each other. Epi, hypo, hypo, epi. Yeah. And then now state the functions of uh, amylase in the human body. So amylase is an enzyme. It's basically an enzyme huh? found in the human body. So when you ask about the function of enzyme amylase, huh? and remember in the mouth, huh? especially specifically in the saliva, you have amylase. And you can remember the process of digestion. You said that enzyme amylase helps to break down the starch present in the food into maltose. So that's basically the function of amylase. And then the, the second part of the question is two parts of alimentary canal amylase is secreted. So now basically you can talk of the one of it is the saliva, then so, so now you can say the salivary glands. And then the next one, maybe you can talk of, uh, let's say, even. Uh, Okay, let's see, let's see. Ah, we'll come back to that a bit less. So now uh, the part the second part uh, the nabita name two photochemical cells in the human retina. So photochemical cells in the human retina uh, have a rods and cones. Huh? Remember we have rods and cones, both are adapted to different types of light. Huh? For bright light, uh, the cones are adapted to detect bright light, but for rods. Huh? It's for dim light. Remember, at night, even if there is darker, you can see, even though it's dim, but you can see something. Huh? That's because of the rods. Huh? The rods are adapted to dim light. So without the rods, you can't see anything at night. Huh? But 
things in the rows that uh, at night you can see vaguely. That's why you see that. Uh, but you see that some uh, some animals like the cats, uh, the cats can see very very clearly at night because their rods are better adapted. You see. Yeah. So then let's see about uh, name one chemical substance and two minerals involved in impasse transmission and in mammals. So one chemical substance, uh, I believe you guys have heard of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is one of the, the chemical substance that can be used in impulse transmission levels. Okay, there's this other one, but maybe it's not covered in the, in the, in high school. We have nor norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is also, uh, can also be used in the chemical substance in a synapse, you know, impulse transmission or cast through synapses. Eh? So that's the chemical substance. But now the mineral ions, eh? and talk about the mineral ions. We have sodium. It's the most common in potassium and calcium. Those are the three main uh, mineral ions that are involved in impasse transmission. Sodium, potassium, and calcium. You learn in higher levels that uh, each of them is, uh, there's a place where it's adapted. Eh? For example, the calcium uh, in the heart, uh, impasse transmission through the heart, you use the calcium. But for the muscle, we use the, mostly the, okay, calcium is also used, and you also use a bit of sodium. Yeah. And so let's see about. Uh, and the next question, give the function of melanin pigment produced in the skin of a man. So melanin, I, I believe you've heard of, uh, of your similar albinos. Eh? Yeah, okay. Basically, the problem that they usually have uh, is that uh, they lack the enzyme that secretes melanin. That's why their skin is, how do I say, uh, their skin is pale somehow. But now for the blacks, especially the black people, you have a lot of melanin. Eh? And that's the melanin that uh, you can be able to to absorb eh? or uh, to stop radiations, eh? ultraviolet radiations from the sun from reaching the inner organs. That's the function of melanin. Eh? And then uh, the other one is uh, number 10. Eh? What is the importance uh, of saprophytic bacteria in an ecosystem? The importance of saprophytic bacteria in an ecosystem it's to break down dead organic matter. Remember, the saprophytic bacteria, they, they, okay, they feed on or they break down dead decaying matter. So this function, they have two functions. First of all, they, they break down the dead decaying matter. That's one. And then the next one, remember when you break down those dead organic matter, you'll be recycling nutrients into the system. So the next function of the saprophytic bacteria, it's that... Uh, uh, it recycles nutrients back into the ecosystem. So, uh, uh, breakdown of dead decaying matter, and then uh, the other one is uh, uh, the other one is that one recycling of nutrients into the ecosystem. Now, number eleven. Why are students were crying out an experiment observed eight cells across the field of view of light of the microscope. If the diameter of the field of view is five millimeter, calculate the average length of each cell in micrometers. So remember that uh, there's this formula that we learned uh, earlier, that when you want to calculate the length of a cell in a micro, of in a microscope, uh, that's observed across the field of view, you have to take the, uh, the length of the field of view, divided by the number of cells counted across the field of view, which means that now if you want to calculate the average length of each cell in micrometers, you have to take the length of field of each five millimeter, you divide by eight cells. That will give you 0 0.625 millimeters. Eh? That's the length of uh, each cell, eh? average length of each cell. Obviously, they are not the same. Way. And now number 12, uh, state one feature present in the flowers that can be used to distinguish between a mycotyledonous flower and the dicotyledonous flower. Now, here we use the floral parts. When I say the floral parts, what do I mean? I mean floral parts are generally sepals and petals. So for sepals and petals, in monocotyledonous, they, they occur in groups of three, sir. But in dicotyledonous, they occur in groups of four or five. So if you find a plant has four sepals or five sepals or five petals or four petals, that's a dicotyledonous plant. Eh? But if you find that it has a uh, three or groups of three, maybe six, that means uh, it's a uh, a uh, a dicotyledon. So now let okay, sorry, monocotyledonous groups of three, dicotyledonous four, five, 
Then the graph below shows the levels of estrogen and progesterone during the human menstrual cycle. Mark on the graph the curve that represents progesterone. So remember that uh, for this cycle, we start with the rising levels of estrogen, which is this one. The dotted one is the, is the estrogen. And then it will reach a point when it starts decreasing. Then the progesterone will increase. The, estrogen, the progesterone is the one that maintains the pregnancy. So it's basically this, the estrogen, the upper graph, the dotted one, and the full graph or the full cover is the progesterone. And now, which is most likely the of ovulation from the graph? If you want to obtain the day of ovulation from the graph, it's where the levels of estrogen are falling while progesterone are increasing. So it's about here, about here. It will be day 14, mostly day 14. And now what are fossils? So for fossils, you can say that uh, these are remains, remains of maybe remains of organic matter that are found within maybe in rocks or something. You know, this organic matter died a long time ago, but then they have been sedimented. You find them in rocks. So now, uh, state two limitations of these fossils in the evidence of evolution. First of all, uh, some of the fossils are incomplete. Why? During sedimentation, or rough, you know that some of the fossil fracture them, mean that you can't get enough information or complete information. And then for the other limitation uh, is that, uh, well, the fossils uh, cannot give you uh, exact information about time. You won't know the exact time. Okay, even if you use the carbon date in a rocks, you won't get the exact time when this animal died or the oh, the animal this time when that this animal is to live. So basically, uh, today we will reach up to there number 14. In the next video, please ensure to watch the next video. We are going to cover the rest of the paper. Yeah. Uh, have a good day guys thank you for watching and please share the video like and subscribe subscribe yeah, so that you may be informed of more videos that you thank you